Hey, what's up guys, and in this video, I'm going to be showing you guys how to make a top-down shooter game with Rust and Bevy in under 10 minutes. If any of you have questions about this video, make sure to join the Discord server with the link in the description, and I'll try to answer the questions that you guys have. Also, if you're having trouble following along with the tutorial, you can just slow down the video, and all the code is uploaded on GitHub in case you want to just nab that code instead of actually following the tutorial. With that said, let's jump into the video. I'm going to start with a basic Bevy setup that you can create with the simple instructions from the official Bevy setup link in the description. The assets folder of this tutorial can be found using the GitHub link in the description. You also need an animation wrapper file which can be obtained by opening the source folder in the repository under the name animation.rs. First, I borrowed a player sprite that I had made a while ago from one of my game jams. If any of you are into game jams, make sure to check out the rest of my videos on this channel. I made this sprite in a sprite and exported it as a sprite sheet PNG file. I made sure that I had padding on the sprite because Bevy often creates artifacts on the sprite when it doesn't contain padding. I think this is due to floating precision errors. Also, since this is a simple top-down game, I decided to remove every animation except for the run animation and the idle animation. The first thing I wanted to do was to add the player into the scene and have him play his run animation. Sprite animation is actually pretty easy in Bevy. Something I made to speed the process along, however, was an animation wrapper, which you can find in the GitHub link in the description under animation.rs in the source folder. I decided to create this in case there are a lot of beginners who just want to get their feet wet with Bevy while more experienced people implement their own animation methods or try to understand my own implementation. Now we must link the animation wrapper we just made to our main file. To do this, we obtain a reference to the file using public mod animation that we can now access in the rest of the main file. Next, we add the animation system to our Bevy app. What a system does is run over and over again, updating the data that we pass to it each time. In this case, our animation system is updating the sprites that we send to it and animating them. Finally, we can add our player to the scene by spawning it in using entity commands. Take note of our texture variables above. The first variable loads the image in using a folder named assets as a root, root path. So I would advise all of you to create a folder called assets and store all of your assets such as images in that folder. The next variable creates a texture atlas from the image. You may have to adjust properties if you are planning to use an image with a different resolution or number of frames in the animations from mine. Since each tile in the sprite, sprite sheet is 8x9, we add a padding of 1 in order to get 10x9. Great, now we have an entity on screen playing our run animation. Now it's time to make it move. To do this, I created a file named player.rs. First thing we want to do is create a movement component. This component will contain a speed variable. Next we create a system. This system will also update every frame and its task is to make the player move. I'm going to reference two resources, basically global variables that we can access from any system. Time, which can help us move the player independently of frame rate with delta time. And keys, which gives us keyboard input. Then I create a query, which takes our inputted components and finds every entity with the specified components and lets us modify them. In our case, you can see we used a query to move the player's position based on key input and the speed parameter from the movement component. Okay, awesome. Now we have the character walking around the screen with the WASD keys, but he never stops playing his running animation, which is a bit troubling. To fix this, all we have to do is add some statements in the code, changing the current animation using the animator component that we added earlier. But now we are faced with another issue. When we move to the left of the screen, our player still faces right. So we have to find a way to flip the player based on the direction he is moving. To do this, all we have to do is change the Z rotation based on which direction the player is facing. If he is facing right, we will just keep it the way it is. However, if he is facing left, we will change it to 180 degrees or pi radians. After some messing around, we finally have a completely functional player movement controller. The next logical thing to do is to add shooting, because the aim of this tutorial is indeed to make a top-down shooter game. First, I made a very simple gun sprite in A sprite and created a shooting animation for it. The first thing I did was to add an entity similar to our player but without any logic. This entity would just be playing the gun shooting animation to first visualize where it would be. Now we should make a way for the player to control the gun. I decided on using the mouse position to determine its location because this seemed the most intuitional. First, however, the gun doesn't even follow the player when it moves, so I decided to add a component called player attach and add an offset component that I would change to adjust where the object is. This is optional in case you don't actually need to adjust it. Next, I added a system that actually made the object follow the player, gun.rs, which is where we will program all the code that controls the player's gun. I created an empty component marker for now called gun controller just to help our query identify our gun. Then I used some math as well as Bevy's cursor controls 
to make the gun rotate towards the player. In order to make the gun continuously follow the player, I made a resource to store the cursor position, as I've referenced earlier in the video. A resource is just a structure, as a global variable that we can access from any bevy system very easily. Now you get to learn how to make them, which is very simple. All you have to do is make a struct with a derived sign of resource and use an insert resource in the main file. I also made sure to adjust the Y scale of the gun according to whether the cursor was to the right or to the left of the player so that it didn't look too weird on the left side of the screen. Another thing that you can do is in the sprite file adjust the width and height of the sprite so that the center is where the bottom left of your gun is. This will make your gun rotate in a more natural way. I decided not to do this for the sake of simplicity in this tutorial. Now it was just a simple action of adding the specific components and systems in our main file in order to have the gun follow and rotate with the player. Finally, it's time to implement shooting. But first let's export a bullet sprite so that we can have an image to use as our bullet. Now let's implement the shooting. In order to do this, I added two parameters to the gun controller component. Shoot timer and shoot cooldown. The names are pretty self-explanatory. Shoot timer is the timer we'll be using to determine when the player is allowed to shoot, while shoot cooldown is the time in between shoots. Using Bevy's time resource, we will subtract time from the shoot timer. When it's greater than zero, the player will shoot its shoot animation. When it's less than zero, the gun will play an idle animation. In addition to this, whenever we reset the timer, a bullet launches. So it is time to find a way to spawn a bullet into the game. To do this, I added a file called bullet.rs. In this file, I created a component called bullet with parameters of lifetime, speed, and direction. Next, I added a system to update bullets called update bullets. The logic of this system was extremely simple, iterate through every bullet all the while updating its lifetime and its position, despawning the bullets when their lifetime runs out. Now I just spawned the bullet whenever the timer was reset and we had a working gun that didn't do anything yet. Now that we had bullets moving around the screen, it was time to add in enemies that the player could actually shoot. To do this, I created a new file called enemy.rs. I added a component called enemy which contained a health variable and a speed variable. Then I created a system called update enemies to move the enemy towards the player with the simple normalize function, as well as despawn it when its health reaches zero. Now we need a way for the bullets to interact with the enemy and chip away at its health. To do this, I created another system called update bullet hits. This function will be a really simple function that checks whether each bullet can collide with the enemy in the scene. However, the way we do this will be a lot more complicated than the previous functions that we have written, as we need to iterate over two lists and compare them with lists in O and squared time, if anyone knows what that means. There are probably more efficient ways to do this with spatial partitioning, but for the purpose of this tutorial, we'll just be brute forcing our bullet collisions. The way we will do this is first query a list of our bullets and make a list of their positions. Then we iterate over enemies in a query, and instead of querying again for bullets, use the list that we generated to check if the distance between the enemies and the bullets is sufficient. If it is, it removes the bullet from the list of bullets while also destroying the bullet entity tied to the bullet. Because removing an enemy will shift the list a bit, we have to subtract an offset index as well as the list of the bullet in our while loop to not mess our loop iteration up. After doing so, we delete the position from the vector of bullets because we don't want one bullet to hit too many enemies, as without collision like we are doing right now, enemies can easily stack up. If the distance is sufficient, we merely subtract one unit of health from the enemy. Since interaction is now complete between the player and the enemy, we need a way for the enemies to spawn so that the player can actually kill them. To do this, I created another file called enemyspawner.rs. In this file, I created a component called enemyspawner which will handle spawning the enemies. First things first, however, we add a random library dependency to our cargo.toml file because Rust doesn't have support for random values natively. We create a system which will spawn an enemy every specified interval. It will spawn it on an edge of the screen depending on randomized values which are generated using a rand library in our cargo.toml file. If you need any help, join the Discord server using the link in the description. And if you have any code troubles, all you have to do is go to the GitHub website and just check out the source code. You can even copy it all if you want to. Just make sure you understand it. Anyways, that's it for the video. If you enjoyed this video or it helped you in any way, make sure to slap that subscribe button before my mother slaps me for not doing my math homework. See you in the next one.